Hello, this is Tom from anti-proton.com. I just got off of work a couple hours ago. I haven't had a chance to really do too much today. I have good news, bad news, and rainwater testing, of course. First off, I found some interesting results this time. Well, anyhow, yeah, they're a little bit different than I expected. Uh, normally, I'm coming to the point where I'm just kind of expecting radon washout, but my motto is test everything, because you never know what you might find. I mean, there could be something else. I've wanted to pick up, I know this sounds really weird, and y'all are going to probably flame me for, for this, but I really have wanted to actually pick up some genuine Fukushima fallout. The problem was that I didn't have my um, uh, multi uh, my multi-channel spectrum analyzer, excuse me, and scintillation uh, device back when there was actually iodine-131 floating around in the air. I could have actually probably picked it up. I mean, Berkeley did. Now, Berkeley had a little bit better of a system than I did, than, well, than I do, but still, they picked it up, so I should have been able to pick it up. But, you know, whatever. Didn't have it. I mean, you're not going to find anything like that with a Geiger hunter, of course. But, um, regardless, I'll tell you the crazy news about what I thought I almost maybe found, etc., etc. Um, I wanted to start out with one thing. You're probably wondering why I have this Geiger counter and some radioactive check sources just kind of like chilling right here. Uh, so let me explain. Alrighty, so here we are with the Geiger counter and three sources. Now, anybody who's messed around with uh, small commercially available sources actually can probably at least identify, and maybe not what these are, but what they produce, just by looking at like the colors and some other characteristics. But, let's see if the Geiger counter can tell the difference. Then I'll show you the rainwater, because that's what you really came here to see, the rainwater, right? Okay. First off, let's move them out of the way. And see what we get. Nearly touching it, of course. Hundred and five thousand. Give or take. Next one. Look at that, I have a battery warning. I'm almost out of power, power on my Geiger counter. 65,000. Ironically, they're exactly the same um, exactly the same activity, which is kind of funny. should show you how, how, how much of a difference the uh, particular energy can make for a Geiger counter, which is why energy units in a Geiger counter are basically useless. What about this little guy? Nowhere near. Of course, it's not that hot anymore. Right there, that should be a dead clue as to what it is. Now, as you can see, you can't tell a difference between them. You can tell a difference in activity. This one is obviously the least act active by far. But this one and this one have plus or minus, um, plus or minus 5% on this one, plus or minus 20% on this one. These are the same activity. They're the same activity, and I've actually tested this one against another one that have that actually is cal calibrated to a 95% confidence, and they're the same activity pretty much, give or take a few hundred becquerels, and yet they show up completely differently. Now let's try one more test. The old alpha-beta test, right? Obviously, that's that. We put this $100 billion Zimbabwe note, which is about enough to buy a loaf of bread. No difference. This is not an alpha emitter. And in fact, do I have anything to stick over top of this thing? I don't even know if I have a piece of aluminum foil somewhere. Here's a thick piece of aluminum foil. Thick. Put that over top. That is a beta and gamma emitter. You can tell, right? But you can't tell anything more than it's a beta gamma emitter. That leaves like, what, a thousand isotopes that it could possibly be? And you won't get a decay curve on it either, so that narrows it down to perhaps, well, you would get a decay curve in years and years and years, but not in the lab right here. That narrows it down to like, I don't know, one, two, three hundred possible isotopes. How about you? Lots. Lots. I already know neither of these produce alpha, so I'm not going to spend the time to even go through that. Again, alpha beta producer. We don't know a, a darn thing about these two, do we? 
And even if you were to sit down and calculate the ratio of beta to alpha uh, to gamma, it wouldn't help you anyway because you don't know the efficiency of the uh, Geiger counter. And even if you did know it exactly, you still couldn't figure it out because it still leaves like 50 or 60 isotopes. And several of them are possible naturally occurring ones, and several of them are from Fukushima, so you really have no idea. Of course, now this one's a different story. Now we're just picking up from the other two. As you see, the piece of paper blocked it entirely. So we know that that is an alpha producer. Now let's flip them upside down so we can see what they are. As you can see, we have cesium-137, 37,000 becquerels. Europium-152, 37,000 becquerels. And polonium-210, 3,700 becquerels in this case. Okay. Alrighty. Well, that was fun. Anyhow, I need to get, of course, more shielding. You know, I think in every video I've made for the last, like, six months, I pointed out that I need more lead shielding. Well, I need to get more lead shielding. And the more lead shielding I get, the better I get. Um, lead shielding is pretty effective for scintillators. Not so much for Geiger counters, but what can you do? Um, basically put in my detector, I ran rain from... Uh, Day was it the 26th, I believe? Let's see, was it the 26th? Yep, 26th. I woke up early that morning and it was raining outside. So I walked outside in a delirium. And let me tell you something about the morning. I don't go into my office until 10 a.m. and I consider that very, very early. I am not a morning person. This video is horrifying. I care this much about you. Well, not really, but. I actually got up this early in the morning to take the stuff. Okay, here's the video of, uh, of me collecting a sample, and I am a zombie. It's 7 in the morning. I'm not happy to be awake. All in the name of science. I don't feel like proving anything. Bugsy, Geiger counter, Bugsy, sitting on sample, Bugsy, plastic protected Geiger counter, hiding the um, alpha rays, so it's just gamma and beta. It now goes in scintillation detector, so I'm going to go back to bed. As you can see, I'm a complete zombie. Um, I somehow deliriously got the sample into the sample testing container and fired up the scintillator. I came back in that morning, like maybe an hour later or so, and checked it, and here's what I saw. Alright, it's running in the scintillator now. I'm going to go drink like five pots of coffee and then go to work. Um, yeah. I don't know why I have the peak finder on. It's not really doing a very good job of finding peaks. But, no. As you can kind of see, hump, hump, hump. Not very much of a hump over here because radium, radium 226, which is normally a part of the um, isotopic. Um, uh, equilibrium of natural uranium isn't going to be found here because below radium-226 is radon-222 which is the instigator of this, but there would be a small amount right there. And of course bismuth-210 is right here. And look at the x-rays go. <laughs> Switch to a logarithmic view, it's sort of obvious again. Yeah. Time to go to work. As you can see, I'm still a zombie. I won't be uh, stopping a zombie for at least another four hours or so. Um, there's an interesting thing though. When I got everything back, the results were a little, little bit different than I had expected. Take a look at this. This is a, uh, the actual result picture. You'll notice obviously there's a radon progeny because it's radon washout. And uh, that's neat and everything, but I'll draw your attention to something I found kind of interesting. So here you go. Now that was neat, it was obvious, you see the bismuth, you see the lead, it's right on washout like it's been for the last, you know, eight months or so, ever since the iodine and everything went away. God, I really wish I could have tested it then, because I would have actually found it. I mean, I, I know for a fact that Fukushima fallout rained upon us, because it was discovered by like every major university just about. But it's not around anymore, except probably in the swell, not, some of it's in the swell, I'm sure some cesium and stuff. But look carefully, did you spot it? If you know anything about gamma spectroscopy, you might have seen it. There's a tiny peak right where it needs to be for cesium-137. There's a tiny peak 
also where it needs to be for, the, for season 137 as well as season 134. I, there's not enough there to determine equilibrium, but I saw what looked like both peaks. I'm thinking to myself, holy crap, I just about passed out. Actual Fuku fallout. It's got to be possible. I mean, I've been trying to detect it. Everybody knows. I'm not like trying to say it's not there. I'm just saying that all I'm, all I'm finding is right on washout. It would be neat if I did kind of find it, you know? But I never do. So, anyhow, that's why I can't seem to explain to the um, uh, Fuku fallout folks that I'm not trying to like say that it's not true. I'm just trying to say that I haven't found it with significantly more powerful equipment. Nor have most of the uh, major universities anymore. They're not really finding it around there too much anymore, unless they're using incredibly sensitive equipment. I mean, way better than mine, like half million dollar stuff. But I found peaks at, uh, let me tell you the energies I found in that, because this is kind of important. Season 134, I, uh, there's a, I found a um, trace of a peak at 795.86 keV and at 569.33 keV and 801.95 keV. Those are the three most prominent peaks except for 604.72 keV, and I couldn't see that one because there's a peak at 609 for bismuth uh, uh, 214, which totally blew it away. Because the bismuth, there's no, there's, there's no, I mean, it's, it's absolutely just apparent. There's a huge hump. You can't, you can't miss it. Um, and I saw the 661.66 and the 32.0, what is it, 17019 for, um, Season 137. Let me just point out, by the way, that Season 137 does not actually admit a single gamma, nor does Season 134. Season 134 and Season 137 both decay via beta minus decay. And what they decay into, Season 134 turns into uh, barium 134. Season 137 decays into barium 137, M. Uh, when they decay into those, those are what actually emits the gamma, which is kind of a funny little technicality. So you can mess with people at parties with that one if you want to. Uh, but I looked up all the information on them right here. Well, not the information on them. I've got all of them on my walls here, known samples of them. But I mean the, um, the, the calibration that I have, I got it all set up. And I found tiny amounts of it, but it wasn't substantial. We're talking like uh, 30, 40 counts total for the whole region in 12 hours. I mean, that's like a pinch of sand on the beach. It's nothing. You'd never be able to detect it into the Geiger counter. Not in a million years. It's way too low. And of course, that, that would be how that kind of fallout would be. Um, here's a picture of a preliminary result that I got where I actually just like circled it really fast with MS Paint and sent it off to show a couple of people as I was trying to figure out whether or not it was valid or not. So just take a peek at it and know that, that what you're seeing is indicating C137, 134 is not for sure. It's just right where those should be, and I've color-coded them. So here we go. Now, basically put, I ran a test today, and my computer crapped out on me, and I lost my test. Well, it was the same, it was the same sample, retested. And what I was trying to do was do a 12-hour and see if the season 137 showed up again, if, that is, if that's even what it is. Now, this might not be a bad thing, because in all this time, all the radon project have totally died out of my sample. They're not going to show up at all anymore, because they go away super fast. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run it again in just a few minutes. I wasn't, I wasn't going to do it when I had my samples out because I don't want to actually, I don't want to contaminate it with my samples. They, those go behind a whole bunch of lead to make sure that there's no conceivable contamination. But what I'm going to do is run another test on this thing tonight and see what I get tomorrow. I'll report the results. I'm, I did a, a rapid 30-minute test on it and a 30-minute background, and I didn't get a, a damn thing. So honestly put, I don't think that it's there. Here's the rapid test, by the way. So I don't think there's anything there whatsoever, but it would be awesome if I could actually find a sample of it. I know that makes me like a psycho because I would be it's like saying that it's awesome if I found roaches in my house. You know, it'd be awesome if I if I found something bad. But it would be kind of neat. Just if, if nothing more from an intellectual standpoint, it'd be kind of neat to actually find it, even though it would be such a trace. And there's no way in hell a guy or counter could pick that up. Not even close. Not in a million years. Um, because it's just too small. So anyhow, um, there you go. Um, oh, I will leave you with bonus footage of the CDV700 detecting stuff for no particular reason. It's not part of the video, it's just random bonus footage, so there's nothing at the end of it. Nothing at all. It's not like the movie where they wait to the very end and do something stupid. Just You can totally cut the video off now if you want to.
All right, here we go. We know you want to see this, the uh, CDV700. The video is over. This is just fun if you want to watch the CDV700. So enjoy the CDV700 as I switch it to 100 times mode. Video is over, by the way. I'm just showing it so you can cut it off now. This has nothing to do with the video. But the beta shield open, cesium, europium, and as you can see, polonium does absolutely nothing. Wait, can I prop this up so that you can see it without it falling off the table? Hmm, barely. Look at that cesium go. One hundred. No, sorry, ten thousand. Almost fifteen thousand counts. Twenty millirem per hour, according to this. You're open one hundred fifty-two. Maybe even higher. Nope, a little lower. Now with the beta shield closed. Go to the times 10 mode. About a thousand counts. And europium. Europium's higher in gamma by far. Notice 2,000 counts. Heading towards three. <laughs> That's funny.